Um, our second speaker tonight is Dr. Tina Tan. Dr. Tan is an attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases and the Medical Director of International Patient Services Program at the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Um, Dr. Tan has also worked very closely with our Lurie Cancer Center team to advocate for and to implement a vaccine program for all of our patients facing cancer treatment. Um, she really does, I'm gonna embarrass you here, Tina, she really does work tirelessly tirelessly to promote this message of proactively guarding against vac vaccine preventable diseases. And she'll be talking to us tonight about the importance of adult immunizations, and which is very timely. Um, we're in a time where vaccines are in the spotlight of all kinds of preventative medicine. So I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Tan. Well, thank you, Diane. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is something that you actually have control over, and that is getting an immunization. So I'm going to talk about the importance of adult immunizations in their, in their ability to prevent vaccine-preventable illnesses. So what is a pre vaccine-preventable illness? People ask this question all the time. A vaccine-preventable disease is an infectious disease in which an effective preventative vaccine exists. And some examples of vaccine preventable illnesses are shown there. The one that I think most people are familiar with is influenza. But if you think about it, there are other vaccines that you get on a pretty routine basis that protect against things like tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, measles, shingles, et cetera. And we know that infants and children are routinely vaccinated against um, 17 deadly diseases, while adults can be routinely vaccinated against 15 deadly diseases. And when you look at the 15 diseases that adults can be vaccinated against, notice here that COVID-19 is now considered to be a vaccine preventable disease. But, you know, contrary to what a lot of people believe, adults really are recommended to receive routine vaccinations against all the diseases that are shown here. And this basically shows you how effective vaccines have been in preventing vaccine preventable diseases. So this shows you in the first column, the different diseases. The second column shows you the number of cases of those diseases before vaccines were available. The third column shows you the number of reported cases of those diseases in 2019. And then the far right column shows you the percent decrease in the amount of disease that's been seen. And what you can see is that for the vast majority of the diseases for which we have vaccines available, the vaccines have done a fabulous job at decreasing the amount of disease seen so that for the majority of these diseases, the decrease has been anywhere from 90 to 100%. The one disease that we've eradicated from the entire world has been smallpox, but you can see for other diseases, at least here in the United States, we really do not see them any longer secondary to the, um, the fabulous job that vaccines um, are doing. So just by way of background um, in the adult population, we know that there are over 255 million adults over 18 years of age that live here in the US. And we know that the prevalence of vaccine preventable diseases is higher among adults than among children. Um, when you think about it, vaccine preventable diseases cause anywhere from 50 to 90,000 deaths each year and over 1.5 million hospitalizations um, in the adult population. And, and that's despite the availability of safe and effective vaccines against these diseases. Another way to look at this is how expensive these diseases can be. In the US, every single year, we spend an estimated $27 billion treating just four vaccine preventable diseases in adults that are 50 years of age and older. And these diseases are influenza, pertussis or whooping cough, pneumococcal disease, and shingles. So you can see that if people would get vaccinated, we could decrease the amount of healthcare spending that is occurring um, in the US um, for vaccine preventable diseases. Now, one thing that I need to mention has to do with COVID-19. Um, in the U.S., since the start of the COVID-19 pan pandemic, there have been over 35 million people that have been infected, with over 32 million of these individuals being adults. And this has resulted in over 600,000 deaths in the adult population, 
in just the last 14 months since the pandemic was declared. We know that persons of any age with underlying conditions are at increased risk for developing severe COVID-19 disease complications and hospitalizations if they become infected. And we know that 10% of individuals who have been infected with COVID-19, doesn't matter whether you have mild or severe disease, continue to have moderate to severe symptoms that may persist for multiple months after they recover from an acute COVID-19 infection. And these are the COVID-19 long haulers that you hear about. We know that the negative economic emotional and psychological impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been significant. And now we know that COVID-19 is a vaccine preventable disease. Now, if we look at cancer and individuals that have been diagnosed with cancer, um, in 2021, it is estimated that there will be 2,000 or almost 2,000, I mean, almost 2 million new cases of cancer um, here in the US. And as of January of 2019, there are almost 17 million people living beyond a cancer diagnosis. And this number is actually expected to increase to over 22 million by the year 2030. What we do know is that all the vaccine preventable diseases may be more severe in persons with cancer and other immunocompromising conditions. And there is a significantly higher risk for complications, hospitalizations, and death if individuals with cancer come down with one of these vaccine preventable diseases. So let me just explain some of the different things about these vaccine preventable diseases. And let's just look at influenza to start with. We know that each year there are somewhere between 10 to 45 million infections caused by the influenza virus. And this can result in up to 800,000 hospitalizations and between 30 to 50,000 deaths. Um, if you look at influenza as a whole, we know that 90% of the hospitalizations and deaths occur in persons 65 years of age and older. And if individuals have cancer or other immunocompromising conditions, the, the number of hospitalizations and deaths increases. Pneumococcal pneumonia is one of the most common forms of community acquired pneumonia. Um, in, the, in the US. And annually, there are an estimated 390,000 cases that result in 150,000 hospitalizations and 30,000 deaths. Now, the pneumococcal organism can also cause bloodstream infections and meningitis, which is an inflammation and infection of the membrane surrounding the brain. And this can account for an additional 3,500 deaths a year. Hepatitis B. Uh, we know that there are an estimated 46,000 new cases each year here in the U.S., but this only represents about 10% of the cases that are reported. So you can see that there's many more cases of hepatitis B that are not reported. And this accounts for two to 4,000 deaths each year. If you look at herpes zoster virus, which causes shingles, there are an estimated 1 million new cases of shingles that occur each year, and we know that one out of every three adults will develop the disease during their lifetime with many individuals having more than one episode of shingles. We know that the rates of disease are highest among persons 65 years of age and older and in those with underlying conditions and that 10 to 15% of persons 65 years of age and older will develop complications from shingles with the most common one being post-hepatic neuralgia, which is where individuals develop a burning pain um, along the site where the rash is, even after the rash has disappeared. And this pain can be so debilitating that people cannot go about their normal activities of daily living. Pertussis a whooping cough can cause a severe prolonged cough illness with up to 30% of adults developing one or more complications. And the most common complications are shown there. These include fractured ribs, hearing loss from ruptured eardrums, pneumonia, urinary incontinence, and seizures. So you can see that having a vaccine preventable disease is not a benign thing. And being able to choose to be vaccinated is something that you have control over. And I'm gonna talk about the 10 major reasons why adults should be vaccinated 
These are reasons that have been put together by the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the National Infectious Diseases Foundation. The first one of these is that we know that vaccine preventable diseases have not gone away. The viruses and the bacteria that cause illness and death still exist and can be passed on to those individuals that are not protected by vaccines. We also know that we're a very mobile society so that global travel can make it very easy for these diseases to spread since in many countries, they don't vaccinate the way that we're able to do here in the United States. So these diseases are, um, they exist in those countries in very high numbers. And if somebody is unvaccinated and goes to these other countries, they can pick up this disease and come back to this country and spread it. We know that vaccines will keep you healthy. The CDC does recommend vaccination throughout the lifespan to protect you against these infections. And when you don't get your vaccines, you leave yourself vulnerable to infections due to these different um, bacteria and viruses. So if you don't get vaccinated, you can come down with shingles or with pneumococcal disease or influenza, hepatitis B or pertussis. And this is just to name a few. We know that vaccines are important to your overall health as diet and exercise. Vaccines really do play a vital role in keeping you healthy. And vaccines are one of the greatest public health achievements of all times. They're one of the most cost-effective measures and most convenient and safest ways of protecting yourself against these different diseases. And vaccination can mean the difference between life and death. We know that vaccine preventable infections can be deadly. And as I just mentioned, every year in the United States, approximately 50 to 90,000 adults die from a vaccine preventable disease. And since COVID has occurred, we know that this number is considerably higher since during the COVID pandemic, um, over 600,000 people have died from COVID-19. We know that vaccines are safe. The US has a very, very robust approval process to ensure that all licensed vaccines are safe and that the potential side effects that may be associated with these vaccines are uncommon and are much, much less severe than if the person gets the disease and has side effects from the disease. Now, one thing that people always worry about is they say that vaccines will cause the disease that they're designed to prevent. And that's absolutely not true. Vaccines will not cause the disease that they're designed to prevent. Vaccines contain either killed pieces of bacteria or viruses, or weakened viruses or bacteria, making it completely impossible to get the disease from the vaccine. And the thing that you hear every year is people say, well, I'm not gonna get my flu vaccine because I got the vaccine and it caused me to get flu. That's not possible. Young and healthy people can also get very sick from vaccine preventable diseases. We know that young infants and older adults are at increased risk for serious infections and complications from these infections, but vaccine preventable diseases can occur in anyone. And we also know, as we, um, we saw before, that vaccine preventable diseases are very expensive. The disease not only has a direct impact on the individual and their families, but it also carries a very high price tag for society as a whole. So to give you an example, an average influenza illness can last for up to 15 days. And typically individuals miss four to five to six days of work or school. And adults who get pertussis or whooping cough can lose an average of one month of work. So if you think about this, this has a major impact financially, not only on the individual that's infected, but also in, on other individuals in the community. Also remember that when you get sick, your children, your grandchildren, and your parents may also be at risk. We know, for example, that adults are the most common source of pertussis or whooping cough infection for young infants. And in these young infants that are too young to be immunized, this particular infection can be deadly. So when you don't get vaccinated, when you do get vaccinated, you are protecting yourself and your family, as well as those in the community who may not be able to be vaccinated. And just remember that your family and your coworkers need you. 
In the US each year, millions of adults get sick from vaccine preventable diseases. And this causes them to miss work. Basically, it leaves them unable to care for those who depend on them, including their children and their aging parents. The other thing for those individuals with cancer or any immunocompromising condition is that these particular conditions will um, basically weaken your immune system, making you more at risk for infectious diseases and the complications associated with them. Once you start your treatment regimen for your cancer, whether that's surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation therapy, or other immunosuppressive medications, this further suppresses and weakens your immune system for prolonged periods of time and makes you at further increased risk for infectious diseases and their complications. One thing that we do know is that if you have cancer or another immunocompromising condition and you started any type of immunosuppressive therapy, you're not gonna re respond very well to vaccines. Therefore, it really is important for you to receive your um, vaccine preventable or your vaccines against vaccine preventable diseases prior to the time that you start your therapy to increase your ability to respond to the vaccine and protect you against this disease. And this is something that you should talk to your healthcare providers about. So I think when you look at vaccine preventable diseases and the vaccines that are available, we know that all adults need vaccines to help prevent them from getting and spreading serious diseases that could result in missed work, in poor health, hospitalizations, complications, financial hardship, not being able to care for your family, and even in death. And we know that patients undergoing any type of therapy, this places them at significantly higher risk for infections. Many of these infections can be prevented by administering preventative vaccines. And by receiving preventative vaccines, this will provide added protection against infections to which you may be more susceptible and are an important part of keeping you healthy. And with that, I'm gonna stop and I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Tan. I do have a, a few questions in the chat box here. Um, one attendee is asking, if you've already started your treatment, can you still get the vaccines or will they have no effect? So what we currently recommend is that if you have already started your treatment, you should wait three months after you complete your treatment to start receiving the vaccines. The caveats to that has to do with the COVID-19 vaccine. Many people who have started therapy and have not received the COVID-19 vaccine can get the COVID-19 vaccine. I, I like this is more of a statement than a question, but I feel you're gonna have a lot to say about this. Um, uh, I don't even know what vaccines I should be getting <laughs> as an adult. So um, back on that slide for the 15 different diseases that I showed you there, those are the vaccines that you should be receiving. At the Lurie Cancer Center, we do have a vaccine protocol that's in place that you should talk to your provider about that provides some of the vaccines that for some of the more common diseases. So this would include flu vaccine, pneumococcal vaccines, hepatitis B vaccine, pertussis containing vaccine, and shingles vaccine. And also you can get a COVID-19 vaccine. Th those are a great place for you to start and then as you go along, you can get some of the other vaccines that are recommended to be given in the adult population. I, I like this question. Any recommendations on how to um, convince reluctant, reluctant family members that they should be uh, vac vaccinated? Um, I think that you need to really be very honest with them and you know, tell them that if you have a cancer diagnosis, your immune system has been somewhat suppressed and you are at increased risk for contracting a vaccine preventable disease that your family member may get. So for example, your family member may get COVID. So they need to understand that one way of increasing the protection to you is to get themselves vaccinated with 
these vaccines to prevent them from becoming ill with, the, with that particular illness and then spreading it to you? This is a very interesting question um, about boosters. When you get older, like over 60 years old, how do you know if you need a, a booster or another vaccine? And what's the difference between a vaccine and a booster? So a vaccine and a booster is the same. A booster vaccine means that you've received that type of vaccine in the past. And this vaccine is the same vaccine is being given to you to increase your immune response um, so that you create more antibodies. Um, many adults have not gotten the vaccines that they need to get and that are needed um, as you get older. And this would be the perfect time to talk to your primary care provider, as well as the providers at Lurie Cancer Center about which of the vaccines that you need. This is a great question. You mentioned the timing if you're in active cancer treatment, but how can um, you follow those guidelines if you're a metastatic breast cancer patient and you're always on treatment? That's a great question. So you can receive vaccines if you're not on intensive chemotherapy where your counts are always suppressed. So if you're taking oral therapy or you're getting therapy every couple of months, you can receive vaccines in that time period. And then another, another question, do you have any recommendations given that list of adult vaccinations that you um, went over? Do you have any recommendations of a sequence of vaccinations? Can you get them at all at once? Do they have to be given in a certain order? That's a great question. The vaccines do not have to be given in a certain order. You can receive multiple vaccines at the same time. There's gonna be no um, problem with you developing an immune response if you get multiple vaccines at the same time. So there is no sequence. And if you don't have any record of what you've been vaccinated for already, how do you decide if you should get a vaccine or not? Having an additional dose of the vaccine is not gonna hurt you. It's only gonna give you more protection. So if you have no record and you can't remember the last time you got a vaccine, you should receive these vaccines. And I'm going to wrap up with this last question because we're at time, um, but it is, you know, a good way to wrap up, wrap up because it looks like it's more related to um, COVID and uh, mm -hmm. the illness and vaccines. Mm -hmm. How do you know? How do you know if you have antibodies if you're undergoing treatment? I hear the antibody tests are not that reliable. I'm guessing this means checking to see if you have established immunity after either having the disease or getting a vaccine. So. You know, the um, National Cancer um, Cooperative Network or Comprehensive Cancer Center Network basically does not recommend, nor do the infectious disease individuals recommend that we check antibody titers because we don't know what it means. So it, it, we know that you will develop some immunity. We don't know what titer you need to be protected against COVID, but we do know that if you get vaccinated and you are exposed to COVID, you're only going to boost your antibody titers. So, and you know, you are, if you have cancer, you are at increased risk for severe complications should you get COVID-19 disease. So vaccination is the best way to try and prevent these complications from occurring. So thank you, Dr. Tan. Those were some great thoughtful questions and we really appreciated um, bringing this information to our attendees um, and emphasizing that everybody really does have control and has, can take action on their own vaccination status. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna move on to our next program um, and uh, have a good evening. You too, thank you.